Happy Friday, warriors of the interwebs, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical advice along the way. I'm your host and security aficionado, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting August 19th, 2013. Let's jump right in with some news on software updates, starting with some developments around Microsoft Patch Day. If you follow our blog, WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com, you already know all about Patch Day. But what you may not know is late last week and early this week, Microsoft started revoking some of their updates. Specifically, they revoked their Exchange Server patch and their Active Directory Federated Services update. And they're also warning about their Windows kernel patch, saying that some users are having some problems with it. Now, the good news is they've since updated and fixed those patches. So if you're one of the Microsoft administrators out there who applied those patches early, I'd recommend you check out Microsoft's update pages and be sure you have the latest versions. Next up, this week, Google released Chrome 29, which fixes 25 security uh, vulnerabilities and also adds some new functionality. Google warns that at least five of the vulnerabilities are rated high or uh, very severe. So if you're a Chrome user, I highly recommend you, you update soon, and hopefully you have the auto-update function turned on like I do. Finally, for the Cisco administrators out there, this week Cisco released three security advisories and patches for products including the Cisco Unified Communication Manager and something called, they call Prime Central. So if you're a Cisco uh, administrator that uses either of those products, be sure to go get those Cisco patches as well. Next up is a little security news for my fellow gaming friends out there. League of Legends, a very popular uh, multiplayer online battle arena game, uh, reported that this week some of their servers got hijacked and breached and some data got stolen. Specifically, a lot of customer data that included things like email addresses, your name and, and physical address, your credentials like your username and password, as well as credit card numbers were stolen from their database. Now, as far as the passwords and credit card numbers, in both cases, the League of Legends administrators had hashed and salted those particular uh, pieces of information, which means for the passwords, uh, the attackers will have to brute force weak passwords to actually gain your password, and it's probably very unlikely that they'll be able to gain access to the actual credit card numbers. That said, if you're a League of Legends player and you've logged on to their accounts before, I highly recommend you go change your passwords. And as always, if you happen to use the same password at other sites, you really shouldn't do that and you need to change your password everywhere as well. Let's move on to a story about some drama around a Facebook vulnerability. During this week, a Palestinian security researcher and maybe gray hat hacker found a vulnerability in Facebook. Essentially, this flaw allows him to post to anyone's Facebook wall whether or not he's your friend. And this is a pretty significant vulnerability. If I were a social engineer, I know that uh, you think that everything on your wall comes from your friends, so you probably click on it very often because you trust it. So if an outside attacker is able to post something on your wall, it's a good way to trick you into clicking a malicious link. In any case, this particular researcher actually started out by uh, disclosing this flaw responsibly. He contacted Facebook at their White Hat security page and he, he reported the flaw. And on this page, Facebook actually tends to pay bounties for valid vulnerabilities. However, the people that responded to him actually had trouble trying to recreate the vulnerability for a number of technical reasons. Basically, they didn't really understand how it works. And further to the point, as he continued to try to point this flaw out to them, they eventually just said, it wasn't a bug. So after this, the researcher got a bit more aggressive, and he actually exploited the vulnerability to post something to Mark Zuckerberg's wall, uh, which was semi-funny, but is also pretty dangerous. Uh, technically, you might be breaking some computer fraud and abuse laws by actually exploiting a vulnerability to gain unauthorized access and post things where you shouldn't. And after he did this, Facebook first got kind of mad at him for doing it, which is semi-understandable. 
On the other hand though, Facebook really didn't take his initial disclosure properly. They were kind of dismissive of his original flaw and they didn't really react the way they should have. So on one hand, I don't think this researcher actually was doing anything maliciously. He just wanted to show Facebook this flaw. On the other hand, he really shouldn't be exploiting vulnerabilities without the explicit permission of the person he's trying to show. So it's kind of an interesting situation. In the end, however, Facebook did apologize for the way they handled uh, his disclosure of this vulnerability. That said, they still don't like that he exploited it. So despite the fact that they tend to pay researchers with bounties when they find flaws, they decided not to pay this particular researcher. However, the story does have a relatively happy ending. Another well-known uh, uh, hacker named Mark Mayford, he started a campaign for donations to actually pay this guy for the Facebook flaw he found. And I think they've generated well over $10,000 now, so he will get a check. But anyways, to all the researchers and penetration testers out there, while I do uh, understand how it might be frustrating when certain vendors may not not uh, uh, react to your disclosures properly, they may be dismissive, I still highly recommend you do not exploit vulnerabilities against them without their permission, because technically you may be uh, doing something that is against the law. So let's end with some research that seems to be punching holes in Apple's walled garden. If you're an Apple iOS user, you probably have heard of Apple's walled garden. This is the whole idea that getting content on Apple's uh, App Store is actually rather difficult. If you're a developer and you want to put something up there for iOS devices, you have to go through a pretty rigorous submission process where Apple actually vets your application. They make sure they like it and it's up to snuff. And they also supposedly do various analysis on the application to make sure it's not malware. Anyways, this week at the Use Nick Security Symposium, a team of researchers from Georgia Tech disclosed some vulnerabilities that allowed them to sneak malicious code into Apple's App Store. I won't go into a ton of technical details on how this works. If you're interested, they have released a paper which I'll put in the reference section of the WatchGuard Security Center blog. But in any case, they found a way to design what they call a Jekyll app. This is an application that for all intents and purposes looks legitimate if you just do static analysis of it. However, hidden in the app are what uh, these researchers called code gadgets. So they submit this legitimate looking application to the App Store team. They do some basic basic analysis, but they don't see anything wrong with it. However, once it gets onto an app, the App Store and a user downloads it, when you first run this application, it self-assembles all of these code gadgets and it turns into Hide or the evil application. And this application was capable of connecting to a command and control server and it could then download new malware and essentially it gained full control of, of your actual iOS device. It could take pictures, check out your texts, record from your microphone or your camera, video or pictures, and so on and so forth. So pretty, pretty malicious. These researchers are trying to point out that Apple's walled garden isn't quite as walled as they think. It seems to be that they're relying on what's called static analysis of, of binaries to see whether or not they're bad. And these researchers recommend they do more dynamic analysis. So for now, there's nothing you can really do about this. Uh, Apple will have to change some of its vetting processes to try to find these sorts of malicious apps. But it is something that should show you that Apple devices are not bulletproof, they often suffer from vulnerabilities as well. So you should use some of the same security controls like mobile AV on iOS devices too. So that's all I have time to cover in this episode, but it was a pretty busy news week and there's a lot of other interesting stories as well. For instance, there is a case that may make IP cloaking, for instance, using proxy servers, illegal. And there are some developments to the whole uh, Snowden fiasco where the journalist who's disclosed a lot of the Snowden information, his partner was detained at a UK airport and they took all his computing equipment. So a little drama there. If you're interested in any of these extra stories, I highly recommend you check out the reference section of the post associated with this video on our WatchGuard Security Center blog. And for that matter, I hope you've been following our blog regularly as we post a lot of stories there. You can also follow me on Twitter, by the way, I'm at SecAdept, and you can follow my company at WatchGuard Tech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.